I'm delighted. Thank you very, very much for coming to... Well, actually, this is the very first uh, conference event for the New Culture Forum. It, uh, first time we've been here in, in person. Uh, we couldn't be here in spirit, so we're here in person. Um, and uh, it's um, great to see you all here. Um, very, very pleased that our speaker today is Nick Timothy. Obviously, Nick Timothy, you will know as being a columnist for the Daily Telegraph and uh, also an author and indeed was Chief of Staff uh, at Number 10. Uh, if I can just run through just our agenda today, basically we are going to be doing, listening to Nick, there will be time for a few questions after that and then also uh, today we are launching our latest documentary which is uh, in our Heresy series with Calvin Robinson and so we're going to be showing a very short clip, five minutes of that, and Calvin will say a few words, but that's for later. Um, so now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Nick Timothy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, heresy is the word, isn't it? Um, uh, I should give advance notice that my voice is fading slightly, so uh, I will try not to do a Teresa, um, as she did at a <laughs> conference a few years ago. Um, you are, I think, uh, a hideously white audience, aren't you? Um, and I'm allowed to say that, I think, uh, because... <laughs> mostly white. Uh, because I think the rules say it's wrong to judge people by their immutable characteristics, apart from when it isn't. Uh, we live in a society now, I think, in which this kind of left-wing doublethink is now completely entrenched in which if you break the rules, those rules are ever-changing, ever-contradictory, you face ruin. Social media pylons, ostracisation, reputational destruction, professional death. And afraid of those punishments, most people are doing their best to try to stick to the rules, whatever they may think of them. They play the game, they say the right things, they participate in the rituals, they're bent into shape by the ideology of our time. And that ideology, based on the postmodernism of Foucault uh, and the critical race and gender theories of second division American academics, uh, is of militant identity politics. But like those who lived under the dictatorships of Eastern Europe, most of us know it's actually all based on lies. We know that the ideological gatekeepers, the academics and the activists, the HR managers and the diversity consultants are telling lies. We know that others are telling lies. And often we repeat the lies ourselves because we know that's what we need to do. But really, we understand very well that we live in a house of deceit. In schools, in universities, in the public sector and the private sector, in government and in local councils, in the NHS and even the military now, in Parliament and even the church, in businesses afraid of boycotts, bad headlines and bolshe activists, thought, word and deed are now tightly controlled, all in the name of supposed equity and social justice, terms that are now divorced entirely from their original meaning, and all backed by phony academic theories that claim invisible forces and power structures are holding some people down on the basis of their race, sex, religion, gender, sexuality, but never interestingly enough, social class, for the benefit, they claim, of a privileged <coughs> caste of white straight men. It's nonsense, it's unfair, it's divisive and destructive, but it will carry on happening and getting worse until enough of us are prepared to say enough. I reject it. I reject the idea that anybody should be forced to say things they don't believe to be true. I reject racist lies like the absurd inventions of white privilege and white fragility. I reject the utter nonsense, the racist nonsense of critical race theory. I reject the idea that we should obsess about intersectional identities as long as they're about queer identities or trans identities and things like that, while ignoring the experiences of the white working class. I reject the hypocrisy of being told for years that not enough 
minorities reach the top positions in government, only to be told when they do that black and Asian Tories don't count. I reject being told race defines everything by those who ignore the success of black Brits with African heritage and not always Caribbean heritage and Indian heritage and not always Pakistani heritage. And I reject the resulting hierarchies of racism designed by frauds desperate not to be proved wrong by the success of others. I reject being made to repeat like a robot that diversity is our greatest strength when mass immigration and multiculturalism bring us huge challenges. I reject the idea that there's any such thing as Islamophobia, the cynical construct that amounts to a blasphemy law for one religion alone. I reject a world in which a teacher and his family are forced into hiding after he showed his pupils a depiction of the Prophet Muhammad. And I reject a world in which politicians connive to pretend that isn't an issue. I reject a political culture that pretends street battles between Hindus and Muslims weren't taking place a couple of weeks ago in a major British city. I reject a culture among councils, schools and police forces that means grooming gangs got away with racialized mass rape for years. And I reject the protests that it's a far right trope to even mention it. I reject HR departments compelling employees to open up about the times they've been racist, regardless of whether they have been. I reject being made to say that a man is a woman simply because he feels like it. I reject drag queens giving reading lessons in primary schools. I reject children being taught to racialize and sexualize everything. I reject the assault on the privacy and security of women. I reject the rejection of basic scientific fact. I reject tech firms denying people access to their services because of legitimate political beliefs. I reject businesses imposing contested values on their customers and workers, forcing people to choose between their living and the dignity of free expression. I reject previously esteemed journals, discouraging the publication of research, as Nature magazine recently said it will, that may inadvertently stigmatise individuals or groups. I reject the proposition made by the Archbishop of Canterbury, no less, that our ancestors can only be forgiven for their actions if we change the way we behave today. And I reject tearing down statues from our past and attempts to smear and cancel great figures like Gladstone and Burke. I reject that being told everything about our country is bad and that we're responsible for all the world's wrongs. I reject the attacks on our history and our most important national institutions. I reject the mentality that values and treasures every other culture while denigrating and dismantling our own. I reject the takeover, the long march through the institutions of schools, universities, museums, and all our centers of culture and learning. I reject the encroachment of political agendas into apolitical spaces, from theatres to sporting events, that once bridged divides and help to bring us together. I reject all of these things, and I'm prepared to pay the price of doing so, the personal attacks, the smears, the accusations of racism and bigotry. Because once you call out the lies, and once you no longer care about the liars, none of it really matters anymore. The truth as Kemi Badenoch said in her leadership campaign speech, will set you free. I know not everyone is in a position to do just that. They may fear their employer. They may worry about their friends and neighbors, the pylons, the mob. We all have families to care for and we all want to get on in life. But I think that makes it even more important that those of us who can reject the nonsense and tell the truth must do that. It might not feel like it, but truth really can prevail over lies. Reason can prevail over ideology, consistency over hypocrisy, common sense over academic quackery, fairness over arbitrary cruelty, equality before the law over equity. Unifying customs, traditions and institutions can prevail over division. We know this because all these things were once the hallmarks of our country and our civilization. They were what made a complex society <clears throat> of many millions of people a success. And it might take changes in the law, and it will certainly take changes in culture in lots of institutions. But if we reject this nonsensical ideology of our time, and if we restore those lost virtues, 
then the House of Deceit can fall. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, uh, Nick, for that. I, I know obviously we have some time for some questions, but while you're thinking of uh, what you might want to ask, um, I'd like to uh, ask you myself, <coughs> how seriously do you think the current administration takes these cultural issues that you have just enumerated so clearly? Well, I think um, the Conservative Party definitely carries in it a body of people who are very concerned about these things, and, and that body of people is, I think, larger than in other political parties. Um, they do exist in other political parties, but some of those people, um, you know, as we know, have actually been driven out uh, and face being driven out. Somebody like Rosie Duffield, uh, the Labour MP. Um, but I think even in the Conservative Party, there isn't this kind of robust uh, attitude towards the things we're talking about. I think partly because uh, actually there hasn't been yet, I think, a, a, a clear enough intellectual repudiation of where a lot of this nonsense comes from. Mm -hmm. So people are confused. Um, it, you can trace it back to Foucault. You can go through mm -hmm. the works of various American academics like Kimberly Crenshaw <clears throat> and people like that. But most people don't know this. Uh, and I think they're a bit bewildered by it. Mm -hmm. But they're also afraid of it mm -hmm. because we are living according to these rules, norms, laws, uh, that, in, that are determined by the other side. And, and I really believe that actually the conservative side of the argument on these issues uh, is probably supported by 80% plus of the public. So what we're talking about really is something that, that has been a campaign to capture institutions by, by elites with these, these fashionable but nonsensical beliefs. Uh, so I think, I think we, need to, we need a better intellectual understanding, we need more self-confidence, uh, and we need to understand the ways in which we need to reform institutions to stop this kind of takeover. Yes, I think uh, there is this sense in many people in the Conservative Party that this is just a matter of PC nonsense, you know, political correctness gone mad. Uh, I think it's much more... It's much more insidious much than that. Much more insidious and serious than that. Um, did anyone have, uh, Calvin at the back there? Yeah. Hi, Calvin. Hi. Um, you're absolutely right in that uh, we should not live by lies and truth should set us free, but how do we embolden people to be truthful and private to cancel culture? Could we just summarise the question for the viewers that we haven't got the audience mic'd up for each question if that's possible? Uh, sure. Do you, what, do you want to summarise yes. it all? We would just ask, Calvin, can you ask again? Sorry. Um, in a climate of, of cancel culture, how do we embolden people to live by yeah. truth? How do people respond to this? How can they have courage? Uh, well, I think the truth is a lot of people are afraid and a lot of people participate in the deceit because they're afraid. Uh, so I think the first thing is there's a responsibility on anybody who has uh, the privilege of a public platform, uh, newspaper columns in my case, but members of parliament and other <coughs> senior figures uh, ought to lead by example and to not be afraid and not be cowed and, some, and take the consequences sometimes. Take the accusations and the smears, knowing that you are telling the truth and you are setting an example for people uh, who find themselves in difficult positions <clears throat> if they tell the truth at their place of work or whatever. Uh, but we need to do much more than that. We need to, we need to look at reforming institutions. Uh, we need to look at the big macro legal frameworks that I think often determine the culture especially in the public sector, those things might be uh, uh, the, Equalities Act, the Equality Act, it might be uh, the Human Rights Act, uh, it might be actually the relationship between those things and things like the Communications Act, uh, I was just talking about that at another event. Um, uh, and then I think we've got to, uh, to actually be proactive. So I think something like Toby Young's Free Speech Union is incredibly important in providing the support uh, it gives to people. But we. Uh, we, need to, we need to stop being quite so reactive, be more proactive, and that might mean uh, new laws uh, that, that impose uh, rules on institutions to ensure that they are properly allowing freedom of expression uh, and freedom of belief uh, in the spheres that they, that they control, uh, universities being 
uh, a really good example, but there are many more across the public sector. Oh, uh, Stephen, yes. <coughs> Possibly a variation on the same question, Stephen Bauer, Carrington. Uh, sorry, Nick, I should say I apologize for that. You won't be surprised to know that's not the first time. <laughs> <laughs> um, when we talk about bold, is it going to be grassroots movements that make the politicians bold for fear of their seats? Or is it going to be politicians providing air cover for grassroots movements to be bold in their own situations? Okay, I'll, I'll kind of repeat that for the camera. I mean, basically, do you think that we're going to have to ca have a case, not unlike Brexit, actually, where the only way it worked was by politicians being made fearful for their seats, basically. Is that how it's going to work? In other words, a movement, a grassroots movement. Yeah, I think it's actually got to be both. I mean, uh, these, this kind of thing requires some leadership. Uh, and as I say, I think it, it needs to have prominent people setting examples to give people the confidence that they too can push back against this kind of thing. Uh, but of course, you know, lots of politicians, uh, you know, they can be cautious. Uh, the, you know, they don't necessarily like controversy, especially if, uh, if telling the truth might lead to the kinds of accusations we've been talking about. Um, uh, but they do respond to public pressure. Uh, so there has to be a feeling that uh, not acting uh, and not standing up for the truth in these ways comes at a price. And that's where grassroots campaigning definitely comes in. Oh, Karen. Yeah. Hi, so I'm part of Conservatives for Women. We're a single issue group fighting gender ideology. And we've been so shocked by the sort of capture of the Conservative Party and institutions in the government under the Conservative Party over the last 10 years. I wonder if now, do you think we should all be pushing for proportional representation? I feel that the Conservative Party is sort of such a blockage on the truth and on courage. Is it time for proportional representation? Is it time for proportional representation, Caroline? Uh, well, um, as a Conservative, I tend to believe that if it ain't broke, uh, if it ain't broke, don't don't try to fix it. And, I, and I'm a, a defender of our electoral system for <coughs> a variety of reasons. But I understand your frustration. And in fact, I wouldn't even say it's happened over the last ten years. I would say actually, it's it's been really fast. It's been over the last few years. Um, it's like it's really picked up speed now. That is partly because of uh, the way organisations like Stonewall uh, have engaged with all sorts of employers. Uh, it's partly the fact that actually there's this uneasy relationship between what between the, the senior civil servants and the politicians in terms of determining what you know, who, who's responsible for what a department does, like as an employer and that kind of thing. Uh, but I think it is it is because there's a reluctance for a lot of conservatives. Um, to really get involved in the culture war. They don't like it, they wish it wasn't happening. Uh, I used to think this myself, it's like culture wars are bad, they're, like, they're basically really destructive. You have uh, sort of progressives burning, they're saying let's burn down history and traditionalists saying let's burn down modernity and everything gets burned down. Uh, and there's not very much coming back from that. I used to feel that myself uh, because they are quite unpleasant. Um, uh, and and it's, it's very difficult to reach an accommodation because you're talking about arguments between absolutes a lot of the time. Um, uh, and it's not why a lot of conservatives have come into politics, right? They, they've come into politics to maybe serve, you know, just serve their local community or because they've got strong views about how to reform the economy or whatever. They didn't come into it to think, I'm going to prosecute the culture war. Uh, so some of, them, some of them understand this and are already there. And some of them, I think, need to be dragged there. Gentleman behind, yeah. No, no, it was you, sir, yeah. Uh, so you, you said you came to this conclusion more recently. Was that post your period in government? Uh, because it did seem that you know, the Prime Minister you served under, her big thing was the burning injustices that she talked about in her initial speech. And it wasn't obvious during her tenure in office that she was uh, putting forward all of the very accurate and uh, very eloquently expressed uh, points of view that you made in your remarks. Yes. So what, what did you do about it in office? <laughs> what do you do? <laughs> yes, exactly. Cut to the chase. You know, what do you do about it in office? It's as simple as that, you know, politicians. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of these things have actually emerged since then. I mean, genuinely, I don't think trans rights uh, uh, was in any way uh, a, a topic that was sort of discussed almost at any level, even as recently as 
2017, when I went, which was the year I left Downing Street. And it certainly wasn't uh, between 2010 and 15 when I was in the Home Office. Uh, I mean, there were certain things that uh, we certainly did do um, back in those days. I mean, we. Um, I quite, I quite wanted to go much further on things like the Equality Act, but um, uh, in the end of the day, you're, you're an advisor and not a decider. But, um, uh, but we did do things to the Equality Act. We removed the, the, um, the clause that uh, there used to be known as socialism in one clause. That was the sort of the duty uh, to take into account um, uh, socioeconomic differences in, in literally every uh, decision the public sector would have made. Um, uh, we did things like that. Uh, uh, I worked uh, around the clock again. Uh, I'd have liked to go much further on things like controlling immigration in the Home Office. Uh, and obviously, uh, uh, trying to deliver Brexit uh, was rather all consuming uh, uh, when I was in Downing Street. But also, I think, is, one, is the kind of thing where uh, some people say, well, that's part of this culture war. I'm, I'm, not, sh I'm not sure it really is. But, I, but what it is, is um, the Brexit decision was a manifestation I think of people's frustrations that their identity didn't count anymore. The solidarity that national citizenship uh, implies had been rejected by lots of people. Uh, so so that, that was, I suppose, something that we were doing that relates to this. But a lot of the issues that we're talking about, and I think it is incredible the speed with which these things have changed, really have just emerged over the last few years. Um, we've got time for a couple more questions. I, I want to ask one of my own, if I can just butt in now, actually. Chairman's uh, privilege. <laughs> it was, um, you wrote an excellent piece this morning in The Telegraph, uh, Nick. Um, I think the thing is broadly this, that it seems that the voters are <coughs> in this position. They are economically slightly left, culturally right. The whole thrust of this government seems to be culturally left and economically right. Would you say that's the wrong direction? Yes. Do right. <laughs> yes, no, I, I, can expand, I, 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 can, I can expand on it, don't worry. Um, um, yeah, I mean, I, th I, I personally have big reservations about the direction that economic policy is heading in. Uh, but I also have reservations not just, not just for the uh, for the policy reasons and the substantive reasons, but the, the political uh, consequences of, uh, of, of this policy too, because uh, it seems to me to be quite inconsistent with the new electoral coalition that the Conservatives have built. Uh, actually, the, the realignment started before Brexit, but it really sped up after Brexit. And you know, our, uh, our electoral coalition now is much more uh, um, mixed in terms of social class and geography and lots of people who live in parts of the country that, um, that frankly don't just want government to get out of the way, they want government to, to catalyse action and to, and to try to restore the conditions for uh, economic growth and opportunity for them. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, I mean, I have, I have my reservations about that. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah. and, and then you sir there, and that's it, okay? Um, my question I wanted to ask was that, um, do you think one thing uh, that we could do is essentially um, contribute a little bit more as Conservatives to direct action, like for instance recently, we saw the group Save Our Statues place a cliff explaining the, um, shall we be polite and say barbarism of the recent uh, figure that they put on the fourth <coughs> plinth in the car, as in the, the city cars put on the fourth plinth in Trafalgar Square, they wrote, they wrote its history as walls and all. Do you think we need to do a bit more of that, more direct action, as Conservatives to sort of challenge the culture war on the ground? Yes, do you think we need more direct action of the sort that was done by Save Our Statues brilliantly, I think, this week? Well, I think it depends a little bit on what we mean by that. I mean, I think everybody who has a problem with this kind of agenda uh, and who feels like they're being forced to say things and act in ways that they don't believe to be consistent with the truth, uh, should should feel more emboldened to to push back against those things. Um, uh, quite often, the fear of of doing that can be misplaced. I mean, there's definitely there's definitely all sorts of pressures that these activists put on people. But uh, you know, there was a great example about a week ago of a uh, Sussex police tweeted that they were very proud to have prosecuted this uh, child rapist who, since committing those crimes, had decided he was a woman. Uh, and said they referred to 
the, the criminal is she and her. And a gender-critical feminist said, that's a man. And Sussex police tried to intimidate her and say that uh, she wasn't entitled to say those things on this platform. So there was no basis in law whatsoever. And actually enough people pointed this out and the police backed down uh, and deleted the tweet. A lot of the time, the things that are used to pressure people uh, are based on nothing. Uh, it's, it's just made up. Um, and people, often the, the, the people using uh, those kinds of arguments to create the pressure and the people who are pressured by it, neither side really knows actually what the law says. And quite often, you know, we have the law on our side anyway. As for direct action of a different kind, uh, to be frank, I hate it. Uh, uh, <laughs> I'd, quite, I'd quite like people to not disrupt the lives of others. I'd like to not be in a position where people feel they uh, uh, should take the law into their own hands. What I would like is for our, our institutions, the police, councils and others, to do their bloody jobs. Mm -hmm. And that's the way to do it. Finally, sir. So, yeah. Hi, Nick. Thank you for speaking. Um, sort of things I seem to notice over the last few years are that conservatives and the counter movement in general to all of this don't seem to have any sort of long time victories and that, so we sort of know there's changes, whether it be Brexit and stuff. But we seem to have maybe have like weak points, do you think we have any weak points for the same institutions and not actually doing enough to firm up anything we sort of achieve over time, particularly when you see things like the Tea Party and stuff like that. They come, they go and they fade, but always the institutions are being, as we've noticed recently, captured more and more by sort of left in general and yet we have none left. So maybe do we also need to build up some more of our own? Yes, I mean, do we, make, do we need to basically make conservative-minded appointments to quangos, essentially? Well, I would actually say that it's, it's not just about appointments. So I, th I, think the, I think the question was actually a little broader. Um, and this is something that conservatives actually have traditionally just really instinctively understood, <coughs> that, that institutions are incredibly powerful things. They, they shape behavior, they help to set and enforce norms. Uh, um, they, they, they constrain us in ways that, that make you know, collective life in a complex society possible. Uh, the problem is that can also be done for ill as well as good, <laughs> you know, as history shows in all sorts of different settings. And, and I think we've given up on the importance of institutions. We should be, uh, we should be trying to reinvigorate institutions for all sorts of reasons. This is just one of them. Uh, especially in parts of the country where we need to do more to develop the economy and restore sort of civic confidence and that kind of thing. And sometimes we'll need to create new ones as well. Um, uh, but at the moment it feels as though uh, while we do have conservative governments, a lot of those institutions are controlled by people who, who uh, stand for the values that aren't ours and, and that, that limits the, the ability of government to, to get things done and reflect the mandate that they've been given by the public. Right, well, on that note, thank you very, very much indeed, Nick. Thank, thank you. you very, very much indeed for that talk. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, I'm, um, if you'd like to, thank yes, you. Thank you. Um, great, and thanks for your questions, actually, as well. Um, what we're going to do now, he doesn't know it because he's only just arrived, um, but um, what we're going to do now is, um, as you might know with the NCF, uh, we do documentaries. I think we're the only YouTube channel that makes documentaries of such high standard. And um, they're called Heresies. And uh, they, I think, now have got around about a million views in total, which is wonderful. But the next one up we're doing is, in fact, a whole part of this culture war in our institutions, it, particularly in schools, in education. And it is presented, written and presented by Calvin Robinson. Um, I'm going to ask um, Calvin to come up and just say a few words about it. Um, and uh, then basically we will see a five minute clip. This is going up next week on the New Culture Forum channel. So Calvin. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks. Thank you. Um, thank you for putting me on the spot, Peter. Yeah. Uh, I think Nick's already articulated the problem far better than I could, but essentially the problems we're up against in education are the same in the rest of the culture. CRT, 
queer theory, gender theory, it's infested the curriculum to a point that all of our children are being taught it. And the reason I wanted to do this documentary is because the parents who fight back against what we're saying on GB News or online say, no, it's not happening in my school, I don't see this, you're an extremist. So I wanted to show examples of it. I wanted to show the evidence of it. I wanted to dig deep and find out where it's being taught and how. And you'll find out in the documentary that even when the teachers aren't activists themselves, the resources that they are using to teach our children are fully signed up to CRT, queer theory, gender theory, and all of these subversive ideologies that are essentially breaking down our way of life and indoctrinating an entire generation against our own culture. So we're looking into where it's coming from and, and how to fight back. Uh, we talked to wonderful people like Caroline, who I know is hovering around somewhere. And we talked to teachers, parents, governors, and politicians who really get to the crux of the matter. Um, thank you for giving me the opportunity, Peter. Excellent um, uh, analysis of what's going on in our schools, which I think most parents still don't actually even really understand mm. or, 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 or realize what's happening. Um, obviously, we've talked about it a bit before with what um, Nick Timothy said, but for me and for the New Culture Forum, we are the foremost cultural think tank now in this country. This, these issues are of more than vital importance. They are a question of cultural life and death, actually, to me. And um, therefore, in November, we're going to be bringing out another publication, which is called Fighting Back. And it's a series of essays, all of which pertain to various particular parts of our national life, about how, in fact, we can fight against what seems to be an unstoppable tide, because I feel that we can't really rely on the people over there. So um, please look out for that. It's called Fighting Back. Um, thank you very much to Nick again, and thank you very much to Calvin. Um, you will see that there is a book here, The Long March to Institutions. That was sort of part one of our, uh, which hopefully will be a trilogy where we are once again victorious. Um, but please have a drink, ladies and gentlemen, and um, do meet each other and um, see you at our next event. Thank you very much. Hello. If you're enjoying the New Culture Forum channel, and you believe in our mission, may I invite you to join our membership scheme at the link below or on our website, newcultureforum.org.uk. Our work is more important now than ever, and we have great plans ahead for the future, but we can't do it without your support. From as little as three pounds per month, you can help ensure that we continue on our mission. As a member, you'll receive a range of benefits, including access to exclusive content, invitations to our private events, including here at our studios, free copies of our books, and much, much more, including, of course, our famous NCF mug. If you aren't able to become a member, then please help us by clicking this button and subscribing to our channel. It's completely free. Just remember to also click the bell icon so that you can get notifications when we post new videos. Thank you.